Blockchain continues to expand its reach and really the use cases that sometimes might even surprise you. Music has been one that has been a little bit elusive until maybe now. So today we're going to dive into that. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to Tech Path. When we look at blockchain projects, a lot of times what we'll try to do is really understand use case scenarios because that's the biggest issue with most of the blockchain projects that we bring here on the show is in many cases they're maybe in very early stage or maybe the use case hasn't been fully vetted. Not the necessarily the case with the project that we're going to look at today, which is called Vibrate. And joining me is one of the co-founders, with which is Vasya Weber. And it's great to have you on the show, Vasya. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, so Vibrate, first of all, great name, love that. The way you guys have kind of tied that together with the music industry, perfect for what you guys are doing. Tell us a little bit about what Vibrate does for our audience, really understanding kind of the project, how it works with musicians and music. So the shortest way to describe it is um, we're the IMDB of music. So we're consolidating the entire music ecosystem in one platform. We have profiles of musicians, music venues, festivals, events, um, and we're adding new profiles as we go. So right now right. we feature about half a million artists um, and each of them gets their own um, analytics dashboards. So we can, based on online popularity that we measure for them, we can then create all kinds of charts. And it's a great tool if you're a music professional, if you want to discover new and interesting artists to work with. So if you're a label and you're looking for the next big star, then you can use our own analytics to find out who they are. I've got, I have a ton of, of questions for you on that area of how you're pulling that data together. I want to get back into kind of how you guys started Vibrate what was the kind of the mission and the passion that kind of connected the dots for you to say, hey, this is a solution that needs to be resolved with blockchain? What was the, uh, the ideation process for you guys? Yeah, so our background is in music management. So I'm a music manager and one of our co-founders co um, is actually one of the biggest techno DJs in the world. His name is ah. Umek. Um, so he was playing Ultra, EDC, Las Vegas. He had a residency in Ibiza. So he's really an A-list uh, techno DJ. And back in the days, it was what, eight, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, I don't count years anymore. Um, so we were investing heavily into advertising. Uh, back then it was still MySpace. So we were investing money into Facebook advertising. Um, we were uh, making sure his MySpace page looks good. <laughs> and uh, there was no way for us to really figure out how all this effort and investments are actually influencing his popularity. And right. we couldn't benchmark him. So it was, we didn't have any tools. So we said, okay, let's, let's create one. And that's how we started with Vibrate. So we, we initially we were just measuring uh, very basic online popularity only for DJs. And then we opened up the database so anyone could add new artists uh, and start measuring their popularity. And we ended up with 30,000 user generated profiles. So we said, okay, we're up to something. Um, and yeah, so there we went away from just being exclusive electronic music service. We raised our first angel round. And later on, we figured out that it would be impossible for us to include all musicians in the world um, because if, if you, if you, try to get that database only by using um, APIs and scraping various um, data sources, right. you get a complete mess. So we said, okay, fans need to add more profiles. That's why we released our own crypto token. And uh, if you wanted to earn the token, you would just help have, have to help us build a platform. So if your neighbor had a band, they weren't in a database, you logged into Vibrate, you added their profile, and you got a certain amount of tokens. I like the the whole fan engagement side of it because a lot of times that is really where the genesis of many of these bands and artists really kind of come from is these grassroots areas. So brilliant on you to kind of go in that direction. So let's go into how the data comes together because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you're pulling from certain layers of influential centers, whether it's social media or other aspects of online registrations in terms of understanding how a band or a artist is doing. How are you guys putting together the uh, data sets for you to be able to kind of create that, that IMDB ranking for that particular artist? So yeah, the 
the profile database is crowdsourced. So we have um, the database that we have now is built with approximately 20,000 different contributors. And then it is also curated because we want to make sure that the data they contribute is correct and relevant and that mm -hmm. there are no double entries. So we have about 100 database curators who check each and every entry that we get. Uh, and once we have the profiles in our database, we then connect them uh, with all major social and streaming channels. Uh, we work with ticket providers. Um, and then we match all those links so they have to um, they have to be connected with one single profile. So if you're analyzing Coldplay, you're gonna get only information that pertains to their channels. And then we measure audience growth, uh, their engagement. Uh, we look into how artists are connecting with each other, where they play, how to connect with festivals, how they follow each other online. So it's it's a it's a complete network of. of um, how each entity influences uh, another. So if if you have a small pub and you get lucky and you get a you get Aerosmith to play there, just make a cameo yeah. uh, a gig, uh, then your profile is going to go up because they're they're a great band and vice versa. So if you if you score a gig at the Madison Square Garden, um, just warm up to some uh, for some big band, your profile as an artist is going to go up because Madison Square Garden is a huge venue. Um, and then also, if you have a really engaged audience, if you have a lot of uh, plays on YouTube, if they share your content a lot, again, your profile is going to, your, your rank is going to go up. So that increases your chances of being discovered by a label or by a promoter or maybe an agent. I'm kind of curious because uh, we, we have a back-end engine that we use in our research tools here within our own network for various industries. and. We've been working on it for, gosh, almost a decade now. And a lot of it is based on weighting measurements, especially for online uh, transactions and, you know, you know, mentions, shares, likes, all those kinds of variables that come into a particular keyword analysis. For an artist, how do, what, what, I guess, if I've got, let's say, I'll give an example. If I'm an artist and I'm out on YouTube, maybe I'm doing okay on YouTube, but on TikTok and Instagram, I'm just really huge. How do you guys weight the differences maybe on, we'll just use social media platforms right now, not, not even the other areas that you guys track, but how are you guys weighting the power of any one particular area over another? Is it all based on you know, volume, frequency, density, amplification? What are some of the key things that you're looking at? The combination of everything that you said plus additional additional mathematical uh, functions. So we have um, a really strong product team. So 18 engineers plus 10 um, project managers, including data mm. scientists. So yeah, we're, we're basically putting apples and oranges together yeah, because yeah. Uh, a follow on Twitter is not the same as a subscriber on YouTube, but we have exactly. to kind of uh, um, put them on the same denominator. And it's um, it's an ever-learning algorithm. So yeah. um, it, it's, it takes into account different variables, such as um, the size of the network, the number of subscribers um, that we monitor in, in aggregated, uh, aggregated um, followers that we, that we monitor, and then dynamics. Um, so right now, a, an additional follower in TikTok uh, is worth much more than an additional follower on YouTube or Spotify. So, so weighting wise, you look at what I guess for an artist, what is the, what are you guys finding as the most valuable platform out there, at least on social media? Well, there's a huge um, there's a huge um, focus on streaming services. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, Spotify is definitely one of the most important ones, and that's why Spotify has a dedicated dashboard. So you have yeah. one aggregated dashboard for, for social and streaming channels plus events, and then Spotify has a dedicated one because it's, it's so important for music discovery. Um, Whoever is hot on Spotify is hot in general. So they, they'll get yeah, events, yeah. they'll get uh, high profile labels chasing them. Um, but all in all, it's like I said, it's a, it's a never changing, um, algorithm. So right now it's hard to say what's the most important channel to focus on in order to get, um, higher in our ranks.
Yeah. Is there anything an artist or a venue can do to kind of help bolster their position or their ranking within the Vibrate system? Anything they can particularly do, or is it all based on aggregate data coming in from the community? So that's that's the thing about Vibrate. So it's it's really hard to influence artificially to game your, uh, your yeah. rank. So you have to you have to you have to do good work in terms of promotion. You have to have active channels. You have to have an engaged audience, which means that you basically have to be more popular in order to go upper ranks. And that was one of the one of the reasons that we decided uh, to create our, our own popularity charts because we were just fed up with charts who depended on voting and lobbying. They were all right. the same all the time. They were just superstars getting all the Grammys and, and all the top uh, top positions in chart. So, okay, so within the blockchain side of things, how will Vibrate uh, essentially use the blockchain features? What are some of the future opportunities here where blockchain really starts to play a big part of what you guys are doing? So yeah, we basically have a three part plan. So the first part was to create a database of um, all music stakeholders, which is something that we kind of already achieved. So we have basically every artist that has done anything um, important in, in their career in a database. And then the second part was to create a tool that will tell them apart. So they'll, they'll tell you who's growing, who's fading out, uh, who's similar. So it, it, will, it will enable uh, promoters, event organizers, venue owners, uh, label executives, it will enable them to find interesting artists. And the final step is we'll enable them to book them directly through Vibrate. Mm. So gotcha. like Airbnb for, for musicians. And this go. is the part where blockchain comes in. Uh, because when when we were planning our, our, our path, um, obviously we checked uh, what are the um, um, obstacles down the, down the road. And because within the booking process, you also have to offer escrow services. Uh, in order to protect both parties. So in case the artist doesn't show up, the promoter doesn't lose their money and vice mm -hmm. versa. Um, and we figure out that in, if we want to offer escrow services with fiat currency, we need uh, a lot of, there's a lot of regulation. So you need different things for different countries and it's almost impossible to, to grow, to scale globally. But if you use blockchain-based escrow services, then you don't have a central authority holding the funds, which means that no one basically holds the funds. And there's basically zero regulation here. Um, and that was when, when we first started uh, thinking about blockchain. Once we started thinking about blockchain, we said, okay, let's, let's create our own token, uh, which basically means that we printed our own money to reward the contributors so they don't work for free on a platform. Um, and now, Four years after uh, we released our token, um, just last year, uh, sorry, <laughs> just last week, um, we got integrated into Binance Pay. So now you mm -hmm. could, you basically can spend the tokens that you earn just by buying groceries and paying with, with Binance credit card. Yep. So, okay, so that's a lot of applications. How far down the uh, roadmap are you in terms of implementing all your plans? Do you guys have kind of a, a big picture here or is that kind of the, the core channels of where you're working in terms of block, blockchain development? So in terms of blockchain development, we started, uh, sorry, my phone just keeps ringing. Um, in terms of blockchain development, we started, um, tapping the third step um, just a couple of months ago when we did basically a pilot test of selling a gig as an NFT. Uh, so we sold a live performance of the DJ that, that is the co-founder of a company. Uh, mm -hmm. We sold it for $10,000. Uh, it was auctioned from, it went all the way from 3,000 all, all the way to, to $10,000. Um, and we, it was just a proof of concept for us. Uh, to yep. see if, if people would actually buy a live performance um, th by using NFTs. So why we use NFTs? Because uh, the idea behind behind it was to make a live gig a tradable commodity. So now whoever right. holds that token holds the right to the DJ's performance. So mm -hmm. they, can call it, they can call it in and he'll come play for the wedding or birthday party or an event if, if they're an event promoter. 
but they can also hold it for another two years. So when the pandemic is finally finished and events come back, they can sell it maybe for two X to Coachella. Who knows? Right. So, and, and people, so the, the, the ideal vision is people would buy uh, gig tokens from, from the artists they, they like and then trade with them. Like, like you trade baseball cards. So that was the first step. And, and we have, we now have a call open so artists can apply to drop a live gig NFT, which is, I think we're going to drop it somewhere in the winter. Uh, and then from there, we see how it goes. So if, if we have a lot of interest, then we're just going to implement it as a regular feature on Vibrate. Yeah, NFTs are exploding right now. I mean, the popularity of them, just the different platforms that have been able to do it. We just saw, you know, Shopify coming in with uh, NFTs now for some of the sporting leagues and kind of moving into that direction, I think is going to be a huge. I can't, I'm surprised that we haven't seen more NFT action in the music space. So I think you guys are onto something in a big way. If you look at NFTs and tokens in general in music, because I think this is going to be a revolution. We've seen it in all sorts of content creator spaces of where this is kind of revolutionizing how content creators, not one, are being recognized, two, are being paid. Is there any layer in the music industry that, where you see blockchain NFTs start to kind of restructure the way the music business is done today? What do you see in terms of future there today? So yeah, well, part of our pitch with, with live gig NFTs was now anyone can become a booking agent. So you can buy mm -hmm. gigs from, from, from artists and then you can sell it to, to promoters or to festivals. That was, uh, uh, that was the, an important part uh, that, that people seem to like. Right. And also another, another really exciting thing is the tokenizing of copyrights of catalogs. So we all know stories how Michael Jackson bought the Beatles catalog, and mm -hmm. and so they they they're the reselling huge catalogs. So all three majors are constantly reselling catalogs, um, and and us regular people don't have a chance to own a part of that copyright. But now, artists can release their catalog and they can tokenize it and they can just sell it. So they can split it into thousand tokens, and whoever holds those tokens is. Basically, they can they can monetize their copyright, and there are a couple of um, companies that are already purchasing catalogs and tokenizing them and reselling them. Uh, with the use of blockchain, it's the the distribution of the uh, the money that comes from copyright is so much easier because it it can be easily distributed through a smart contract that knows that that knows the the addresses of the um, wallets where the where the tokens are kept. And it can just simply then distribute the funds. So every quarter, usually every quarter, um, labels and publishers uh, do their statements, and and they pay yeah. to whoever holds the catalog, and they can they can just simply distribute the the money to to whoever holds the token. And you can even there's no need for you to know who holds the token because the smart mm. contracts knows uh, where the token is held. That 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 would the, the, that would be huge. That, that's going to be a, a revolution in the space in terms of, of booking for sure. Yeah, I mean, I see it as copyright IPOs. So yeah. if, if, you, if you're a really famous artist and you, you um, own the, the rights to your own music, which is not the case every time, mm -hmm. um, you can just, okay, you can say instead of selling to Warner, I'm just going to tokenize it and I'm going to offer it to, to my fans. They can, they can now yeah. own part of my copyright and this is a really exciting thing and you don't have to have millions to own it you can you can buy one token out of 10,000 just for a couple hundred euros and then then, then you co-own the catalog of Metallica I don't know <laughs> yeah sure yeah sure okay so that, yeah that is going to be uh, that would revolutionize music in general is this also potential to where you could tokenize live events so a concert series or an entire you know, you know, run of a particular artist, let's say they've got 20 different gig spots and they're going to tokenize each individual city from Cleveland to New York. Is that something that's also uh, in the plan or currently available? Well, no, currently this is not available. So for us, the, the so-called gig NFT is just, mm -hmm. it basically holds a signed booking contract. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it doesn't matter where the event is going to take place. So it's, it's like a blind check. Uh, so the artist has to take into account when, when they set the initial price, they usually have 
to take into account that they might have to fly uh, to perform a gig. So that's why we set the initial price at $3,000 because th this will basically take you anywhere in the world. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, fans can fans can buy um, gigs for of, the, or, of their favorite artists. Maybe not their favorite because they usually charge millions sure. for a gig, but it, it's it's mostly targeted towards local artists uh, that yeah. can maybe make some extra extra buck now that the events are still mostly banned and they're basically sitting at home and and and. and seeing how they're going to survive uh to the end of the pandemic and this is this is the way they can earn some extra buck selling the game up front yeah how accessible and i guess what's the the fan journey with getting involved with vibrate app based web based where is where is a user for the first time trying to go in and explore uh some of these artists and musicians what's the best you know kind of entry point for vibrate so yeah, the first uh, contact would probably be an artist page. So for all half a million artists that we have in our database, we have their public pages that feature right. everything that uh, that a personal page of an artist should feature. So we have top content, top tracks on Spotify, top videos from YouTube, uh, past and future gig dates, along with ticket links. Um, who's following this artist? So we're looking at how artists are following each other because it's a it's an interesting angle. So if, if you're a small time artist and get followed by superstar, that means that you got recognized, and we feature that on those pages as well. Uh, so yeah, that, that will be the first contact. So you can you can quickly check the artist. Uh, but then if if you want to know more, if you want to check the trends, if you want to check their um, audience analytics or where they have the most fans, then you have to become a professional user. So you have to become a subscriber. You have to pay a monthly right. subscription. But that part is mostly targeted towards professionals, not, not necessarily right. fans. Someone in the industry, yeah, for sure. Talk to me a little bit about uh, Travelers.com's uh, partnership, kind of how that's going to play into what you guys are doing in terms of building a, the overall project there at Vibrate. Yeah, so we were really happy when when they reached out uh, with an offer to integrate um, our token into their service because um, we see music as an important part of uh, motivation for people to travel. So a lot of times we would travel to a foreign city to see a concert, and that's why we we said, okay, that's that's going to be the first step to just to integrate our tokens into your system, and then the next step, which is something that we're discussing is that we're going to feature events and venues next to travel information. So when people are going to, let's say, I want to go to London this weekend. Uh, so I'm going to type in London and this weekend's date uh, into their search engine. And then they're going to list available accommodation. And we are going to list events uh, that are happening in London that weekend. So mm -hmm. you can you can now book travel, you can book tickets, you can see if maybe your favorite artist is, is playing at the time that you're in London, and you can you can check their concert. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We're still discussing that part, but so far they, they integrated us into Twala and in, into Binance Pay, so that's that's a good thing for our token holders. All right, so I like the the concept. It seems like it's one of those that seems to be breaking into, especially the content creator space. When you look at the future of where content creators, and this is you know anything from you know YouTubers to artists to musicians and bands, uh, how do you see this market moving forward? It seems like we have more and more blockchain opportunities and a lot more direct to content creators. Uh, type strategies happening. Do you see that kind of taking over what has been once Hollywood and the traditional method in which artists and creators go to market? Well, the first big change that I saw um, in connection with our, with our startup is that um, people in music started using data. And that, mm. that I think that that trend started with the beginning of the pandemic. Because before yeah. that, when you mention statistics and music, people would just turn around uh, because statistics sounds like the most boring field in the world and music <laughs> the most exciting one and, and clashing those two together seems virtually impossible. But now a lot of big promoters um, started using um, our service to, to find out who to book for, ne for their next event. So 
one of the biggest um, electronic music promoters in the U.S., Insomniac, who have 15 festivals, with EDC Las Vegas being the biggest one with 400,000 tickets sold for, uh, during one weekend. They they use their service and they said that yeah. they're, they're going to keep you. They're going to book their entire 2022 lineup just by using data from Vibrate. Obviously, they have to follow their taste and and their uh, their experience, but it's it's a helpful tool um, for decision making. So that that was the first change. But in terms of blockchain, things are still going slowly. Uh, most of it because a lot of times people connect blockchain technology with cryptocurrencies, which right. obviously the, the, both, both parts are connected, but volatility uh, in cryptocurrencies is not necessarily connected with the blockchain technology. Um, and that's why when, when Bitcoin is growing like crazy, people start <laughs> exploring blockchain opportunities, but once it crashes, they just go away. That, that, yeah. That's the first reason. And the second reason is that, honestly, it's still not there in terms of user experience. So you have to yeah. be an experienced user in order to use maybe more advanced blockchain-based services. So once we solve that part, then I think it, it's, re it's really going to take up, um, yeah. take away Vaj into, Vaj into Vaj the space. Yeah. Yeah, when you look at the overall space of block, could you just point? You, you hit on something that I've I talk about a lot, and that is critical mass, the ability for both you know the average person, the average fan, in your particular case of these artists and musicians, to really understand what is happening around blockchain in in and across a lot of of spaces. Whether you look at decentralized finance, whether you look at the music industry, we've seen it now in energy and kind of the whole evolution we're seeing projects in the medical space, real estate space, it's, it's really starting to invade in a lot of places. But the big issue is critical mass, you know, the scenario of people, one, understanding what blockchain is, how it applies to their everyday life, and potentially maybe even investing and in getting into that market. Right now, we're at a very small point, maybe on this next cycle, when we get past this cryptocurrency cycle, which is typically what's on the front of the spear, and we roll into say 2024, and we see an uptake of May 25% to 30% in terms of critical mass, do you think that would be enough for it to really take a lot of these projects over the top? It depends on the industry, I think. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of industries industries that are utilizing blockchain right now, and it's it, it just, it works. So I know of a company um, that uses a blockchain to uh, to trail products. So all the way from the origin to the shelf, right. um, which is an ideal technology because you cannot um, you cannot tap with the data, so you cannot change the data. And and when you're tracking, let's say food, the origin of food, this is extra important. Mm -hmm. um, but I I mean, in terms of retail, so. B2C services, I'm not sure if it's, it's going to be that fast. So in, in the B2B segment, it's quite easy because when you work in B2B segment, you have to learn a lot of things and you have to you have to know how to use services that could, could be complex. But in yeah. the B2C segment, we just employ a bunch of UX experts just to polish the user experience uh, in order to get as much people as possible um, uh, to use our services. And I mean, our parents, they, they it, sometimes it, it takes years for them to uh, to learn how to use email, and then they get Facebook, and then they need a couple <laughs> of months to, to to get to know Facebook. And once they get to know it, no one's using it anymore. So it's uh, it just takes a lot of time. And, and the older the, we get, uh, the harder for us is to, to learn new things. Yeah, I think, well, uh, the key there, and, and I get this question asked to me a lot, is, you know, where is that critical mass tipping point going to occur in society where we really see blockchain kind of taking over? Because it's Web 3.0. If you think of where the internet yep. uh, and how long it took from 1993, 95, 96 uh, to elevate most of the population into utilizing the internet for the first time, and eventually now where it's becoming ubiquitous with society. I think that's kind of where blockchain is is on its track. Question is, is it going to happen in the next 5, 10, 15, or next two decades? Because uh, that, of course, is going to have so much so much implication in terms of the companies that are going to be built on it. You know, the next Facebooks, Googles, Amazons, mm -hmm. 
of the world will come out of blockchain for sure. Energy, you name it, uh, is definitely coming that way. The problem is the sure. huge smoke screen that is cryptocurrencies because people just focus on, on, on a couple of cases that they know people that, that got rich quick by investing into, into some yeah. funny mean crypto token that just exploded in a week and in a matter of a week they became a millionaires. So that that's the biggest problem because it takes all the focus away from the technology. So no one cares yeah. about technology. They just care about getting rich quick. That's, that's the number one reason before the um the user experience i would say you know that that also applied to the internet era the social media era in terms of the birth of those industries you know the carnival's uh approach was there in both of those those categories and then eventually you know the professional applications kind of resolved and then boom you started seeing adoption and then at that point you started seeing investment mm -hmm. and then you know here we are with a, a completely renovated model. I mean, if you go back all the way to the origins of uh, YouTube, you know, it was an original, very interesting space when YouTube was first created. Google got involved, purchased it, and now it's become, you know, one of the number one con, you know, uh, commerce engines for Google. So it's, it's just an evolution process. I think a lot of people just have to get ready to where it's come. But I think what you guys are doing in music, this is a key one, uh, which is going to be a big factor in blockchain, especially around entertainment. So, Good luck to everything you guys are doing over at Vibrate, and thanks so much for stopping in today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent having you on. All right, so you guys, of course, are tuned in today on the podcast. Make sure and give us some ratings. That's the number one way we get feedback from our audience. And of course, if you're here on YouTube, just uh, give us some comments below if you'd like a project uh, revealed, much like what we've done here with Vibrate and understand what the project is about, this is the best place to do it uh, in the comments below, or you can also hit me up on Twitter, straight up at Paul Barron. I'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.